So next, uh, Todd's going to give uh, give you a quick overview of Kubernetes and why this is complementary to uh, GitOps. Containers really give you a, a standard way to package up your application code, uh, and so that the configuration and the dependencies are all within that single resource, that single container. Uh, that helps for repeatability and, and reduces variation when you deploy from one environment to the next. If you're deploying the same container def, uh, definition, then it should be the same in each of your different environments. Uh, Kubernetes also has this concept of primary resource types, like a pod, that can then be also leveraged by higher level resource types like replica sets and deployments. You know, that leads to the fact that Kubernetes can be easily extendable. Uh, so you can extend, you know, for example, if you have a primitive like a pod and you want to implement the functionality of a replica set, you can, you can implement that by leveraging the functionality of the underlying pod. Just like if I want to, uh, create a new type of object uh, on top of a deployment, I could also do that as well. Now, Kubernetes also allows you to add additional operators that are looking at different types of resources in your Kubernetes cluster that perform additional actions. And we'll be talking about operators a little bit later uh, in the stream. Um, Kubernetes also offers both imperative and declarative interfaces. And we'll come back <clears throat> to that. That's one of the key things that makes Kubernetes a good fit with GitOps. And we'll come back to that in a few slides. So here's just a very simple diagram of a typical namespace within a Kubernetes cluster. You might deploy a replica set that says, okay, I, I want to deploy two pods to, uh, to run my application. Uh, that pod might define several different containers. Uh, each container does a particular operation. You might have some one container that initializes the environment, it gets things ready, and then you have another container that's running your Nginx or your, you know, whatever your application is. And uh, those pods can mount volumes, uh, either either ephemeral volumes that are temporary storage or uh, persistent volumes that are stored on external uh, storage. Then those pods can be exposed to the outside world using a service, and then they can accept uh, traffic. So when we start talking about a environment, uh, you know, say an application environment, you really want to define all these different components, and these are all defined. Uh, you know, these are all software defined defined components within Kubernetes. You can you know create uh, services, replica sets, pods, containers, volumes, all by defining them in the configuration of the Kubernetes cluster itself. But how do you do that? So, you know, and how does that uh, play in with GitOps? Well, I, as I mentioned earlier, Kubernetes offers both imperative versus declarative interfaces. And we'll get into more, you know, more specifics on Kubernetes, but to illustrate the difference on the, on the left side, you see the imperative remote control. And that means I want to, you know, I want to increment the volume by one. I want to decrement the volume by one, such like that. So if I'm on channel three and I want to go to channel four, I need to press the up channel button. If I'm on channel three and I want to go to channel one, I need to press the decrement button twice. So using that imperative remote assumes that I have some prior knowledge of the current state of the system and I have to sort of maintain and know what that state is before I can operate it. Uh, whereas if you go with the declarative example, uh, the declarative remote, I just press a button. I just say, okay, I want channel three, I press channel three, I, I press the button for three and it, you know, the TV tunes directly to channel three. If I want uh, to turn the TV off, I press the off button. What if the TV was already off? If in the imperative example, pressing the power button might turn it on when I thought maybe I wanted to turn it off. Uh, so anyway, that's that's kind of a, an analogy for how uh, imperative versus declarative works in Kubernetes. Now, the reason this is important is the declarative nature of Kubernetes makes it much easier to implement uh, GitOps. I mean, that's really a key enabler of GitOps. So here I'm going to do a quick demo to illustrate uh, imperative versus declarative in Kubernetes. If you wanted to follow along, 
you could go ahead and fork this repo and just make sure you're running uh, some kind of desktop Kubernetes environment where you can run you know, Kubernetes commands, either I'm going to be using Minikube and you can follow along. So let me switch my screen now. So in this case, I just spun up a fresh new Minikube uh, cluster running uh, on my workstation. I look, uh, there's no pods running. And I have this script, and, and this is under the, if you're looking at the repo, uh, this is under uh, chapter two of the resources repo. I have the script, and you might look at the script and say, okay, great, I'm doing DevOps, right? I'm writing code to define my environment. So I have these different uh, two uh, CTL commands to create a deployment, scale that deployment to three replicas, annotate that deployment with uh, with some annotations and uh, you know, and I'm good to go. So yeah, let me go ahead and run that. So I'm gonna run this uh, imperative script. And now I'll uh, watch, um, And we should see these continuous creating. I mean, so at least I got the output that um, the deployment was created, the deployment was scaled, and the deployment was annotated. So, so far everything looks good. Um, and now I have three running pods. I'm good to go. My deployment was successful. Uh, so then if I uh, uh, describe the uh, Nginx imperative deployment. Um, you'll see that uh, you know, it's all running and it's um, it's got the annotations. It has the environment prod and organization sales. Everything looks good. Um, so now, so let's say I check this code in. I say, okay, this is my code for deploying, you know, creating my deployment for my Nginx application. And now someone says, well, we really, you know, sales isn't really the right thing. You should really change that to marketing because it's really marketing's engine X. It's not really sales per se. So I go here and I say, okay, let me, fine, let me change this to marketing. So I change it to marketing. Uh, I save the file and I say, okay, I'll just run it again. I'll just uh, run this script again. Oh, wow. Okay. I got some errors here. So number one, the deployment already exists, so I can't do another create on it. Um, the scaling is fine. It scaled to three replicas and it just scaled it again to three replicas. That's that's fine. But then it's complaining that um, the annotation already exists, already has a certain value. Okay, well, I could add the override command and I could do some other, I could do an if check, like if the deployment exists, then do a create, don't do a create, do an update. and if the deployment doesn't exist, do a create. And so I can make this script more and more complicated. Um, but why would I want to do that when I don't have to, right? So that's um, that's where the declarative comes in. So instead of writing a script like this to do everything very programmatically, step by step, um, Kubernetes allows you to define your environment, your desired environment, um, and uh, make changes and, uh, and define it that way. So Here's an example of the exact same result. The, the same end result is exactly the same. Uh, I have these two annotations. I have three replicas. And, but what I'm doing is I'm saying, this is what the deployment should look like. This is, I'm declaring the, the desired state, right? So then if I do a CTL apply and, uh, do the declarative deployment. It, it creates the deployment and everything's set the way I want. Um, I can do the watch again. I can see my containers getting created. Uh, and then if I do the describe and instead look at the declarative deployment, uh, I see it's, it's uh, pretty much identical. It has the same annotations, has the same everything. 
Now, if someone says, oh, you should change that organization instead of sales, it should be marketing. I can go here. I can simply just say marketing and uh, save that. And then I can apply. I'm basically applying the same manifest again uh, from the file. And I apply it and it says, okay, it's configured. And if I uh, look at the deployment again, I'll see that the organization was changed to marketing. So one of the key enablers of, of, um, of GitOps is that you can have this declarative specification of your application, the infrastructure that your application depends on, and you can make changes to that simply by changing this declarative file and then reapplying it to your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and that's what you know, we'll talk about in the section. So, so again, the imperative deployment, uh, you have the script that you can run, uh, but in, instead of having a script to, to run, you have a declarative deployment that has the, you know, the end result, you know, the, the desired state of your, your deployment. How GitOps is implemented in a, um, in practice is you are running a, um, uh, operator or controller um, that is continuously in this this reconciliation loop. It's it's forever in this uh, constant circle of uh, basically checking the contents of a, a Git repo, um, searching that repo for um, basically walking that directly for any um, manifests that need to be applied into the cluster, and then essentially just applying those manifests. In summary, like all GitOps operators are doing this reconciliation loop and the different versions of it might add various features like uh, like a UI on top of that, uh, but they all kind of follow this basic principle. So I often describe uh, GitOps as a kubectl on a cron job, and, and that's actually what the de uh, next dem uh, demo will be about. Um, so if you can switch to my screen, you can uh, go to the GitOps book resources, and we're in chapter two. The examples you want to see is the GitOps resources and the GitOps cron job. Um, so I'll open that in my IDE. Um, so the first thing we'll do is we'll actually install our quote unquote GitOps operator into the cluster, which is for, for this demonstration will be a cron job. Um, but the first thing we need to do is we need to give it uh, privileges. So um, uh, our demo will run in the GitOps namespace, um, and it needs since our operator needs to deploy uh, manifests, we need to give it um, cluster uh, admin privileges. Uh, so this service account and this cluster role binding will uh, will grant our our job the ability to deploy. Um, so let's go ahead and deploy that. Um, Okay, and so then now that we have privileges, let's actually install the quote unquote operator. Um, so if you look at this cron job, um, I have a cron job running every minute. And uh, really, all this cron job is doing is cloning um, a Git repository, uh, walking that uh, Git repository for um, YAML files. And then for every YAML file that it comes across, it's, it's going to run kubectl apply against that uh, that file. Um, so go ahead and apply that. And while I'm doing that on the right side, let's also watch for pods. Okay, so um, it'll take about a minute, uh, but while we're doing that, I can bring up the, um, uh, what is it actually going to deploy? Okay, so um, the repo that you saw um, is just the simple deploy repo, and it has a single service and single deployment. And so what you just saw happen on the right side was um, after one minute, my cron job fired. Um, so this GitOps-cron is the actual Kubernetes job that fired. Um, once that 
ran, you can uh, see that um, some this pod sample app got created um, and, and was running. So now if I, I look at what's in my namespace, uh, we see this sample app deployment that was created, and that, that was this deployment that um, we had defined in my, uh, my Git repository. Okay, so, so what happened here was that uh, I wasn't the one actually doing the apply. It was the, actually the, the GitOps operator that was doing that. By doing so, since like the Git is the source of truth of what you're trying to deploy, your deployment processes can all center around um, using think something like GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket uh, to perform deployments. You don't, you no longer need to give people, uh, your developers, direct access to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and then with GitOps, uh, the changes uh, can go through uh, formal approval processes like pull requests. Continuing with this example, um, let's actually do a GitOps change. So uh, this is a fork of the sample app repo and I, my cron job is, is monitoring this repo. Uh, but let's say I want to bump up the replicas to three and also I want to uh, bump up uh, the version to the second one. So all I have to do is to make this commit. Um, and then eventually uh, the GitOps operator, let me start that watch. Eventually, uh, the operator within a minute or so um, will pick up my changes and then keeps you to apply those changes. And one thing I, I forgot to mention was that uh, the nature of keeps you to apply, it's safe to actually apply that like early and often because uh, the way keeps you to apply works is it only applies the differences that you made um, in your manifest. If there was any it wasn't any differences at all. Uh, the keeps detail pi is is basically a no op. It's, it will have um, you'll even see a message saying there is no changes. Okay, great. So um, we saw that some activity going on in my um, namespace. Basically, you can see that my uh, another GitOps cron job fired, and as a result of that, uh, the sample app uh, got changed. And if we look at the, my namespace again. Um, we see our, that same sample app, it now has three replicas. And then if we uh, look at the contents, um, we see that the image um, has been bumped to two. That's a very, what we call the poor man scale ups. It's, it's useful for um, explaining, you know, the basic concept of GitOps, the, um, but of course, no one is going to run um, their deployments in this way. And so that's um, that's where we get to the more advanced GitOps operators. In our book, we cover uh, three tools, Jenkins X, Flux, and Argo CD. There isn't much time to go over um, all three. Each of these has their own kind of spin on um, their approach to, to GitOps, um, but since Alex and I are maintainers of the Argo uh, CD project. Um, we'll go into um, some details about how Argo CD works.